We humans have been harnessing the energy in flowing water for thousands of years. I'm sure we all know what a water wheel looks like, but just in case anyone's missed it, here's one in action. Very quaint. Today, flowing water in one form or another accounts for about 16% of all electricity generation around the world. According to the International Hydropower Association, the total installed capacity in 2019 was 1,308 gigawatts, generating more than 4,300 terawatt hours of electricity. The vast majority of that power comes from hydroelectric dams on large river systems, which have developed into extremely sophisticated and efficient engineering marvels. But as we've discovered in previous videos on this channel, those dams also come with significant environmental impacts upstream and downstream, as well as greenhouse gas emissions from their construction and from the reservoirs immediately behind them. What we haven't been quite so successful at, at least not so far anyway, is harnessing the almost unimaginable quantity of energy in our oceans. Wave and tidal power does exist, of course, but high costs and limited availability of suitable sites have hampered progress towards large-scale implementation. That's been changing quite rapidly in recent years, though. New materials and turbine technologies are opening up a wider range of geographical locations, suggesting the total availability of tidal power may be much higher than previously assumed, and at a much more competitive cost with a far smaller environmental impact than large hydroelectric dams. And at the end of April 2021, the world's most powerful tidal turbine, boasting some pretty groundbreaking design features, was launched off the east coast of Scotland. So could this be the game changer that the tidal energy industry has been looking for? Hello and welcome to Just Have a Think. One of the biggest criticisms of renewables like wind and solar is of course the old bugbear of intermittency. And that unpredictability is being addressed to a large extent with modern energy storage solutions, many of which we've looked at on the channel. But tidal energy has the great advantage of being entirely predictable and reliable because it's driven by our orbit around the sun and more importantly, by our planet's rotation combined with the gravitational pull of our moon's orbit around us. All three of those dynamics look set to stay pretty regular for several million years to come. So you can see the appeal of using the tides to generate reliable renewable energy at potentially extremely large scale. Plus, ocean water is more than 800 times denser than air. So in theory, you can generate vastly more energy per unit volume by sinking a turbine underwater than you can from putting one up in the wind. The world's first large-scale tidal power plant went into operation way back in 1966 at the Rance Power Station in Brittany in France. That facility remained the largest in the world right up until 2011, when the Siwa Lake Tidal Power Station was built in South Korea. The 10 turbines there have a combined generating capacity of 254 megawatts. Both those installations are examples of a tidal barrage, otherwise known as a tidal range device. Essentially, they're just dams, very similar to the type seen on major rivers around the world. But instead of using the flow of a river, they exploit the change in energy between high and low tides to turn their turbines and generate electricity. They're very large and relatively expensive. They also have to be constructed in locations like the mouth of an estuary, where they can be permanently anchored to the land on either side and they can have similar environmental impacts to hydroelectric river dams. Tidal stream devices, which you and I know better as tidal turbines, generally have far lower installation costs, much greater flexibility of location, and are way less impactful on the local environment and ecology. As a result, especially in more recent years, far more investment and development has been focused on tidal turbines than tidal barrages. But unlike wind turbines, where the classic three-bladed design has been fairly widely accepted as the most efficient configuration, especially at larger scale, there are still lots of different designs for tidal turbines, all vying for supremacy in what is still a relatively young but potentially very lucrative industry. This latest design is called the O2 tidal turbine. It's the product of 15 years of continuous development from an Orkney-based engineering company called Orbital Marine Power. 
It was built at the Fourth Port Quayside facility in Dundee, Scotland, and towed out on the 22nd of April, arriving two days later at an interim commissioning location at Deer Sound, where it will undergo final testing and tow trials before being taken to its final location at the European Marine Energy Centre, or EMEC, in the fall of Warness in Orkney. In a recent BBC interview, Orbital's chief executive, Andrew Scott, pointed out that Orkney was an ideal location to host the new turbine, not just because that's where the company's headquarters are located, but also because Orkney sits in some of the strongest currents in the world, with sea conditions that can get fairly ferocious, and that makes it an ideal location to test and develop these sorts of technologies, which will ultimately have to stand the test of time in some of the most unforgiving environments on Earth. It's not the first machine from Orbital to arrive at EMEC either. Two previous versions have been tested there, the most recent of which was a full-scale prototype called the SR2000, which was put through its paces between 2016 and 2018. That trial delivered record-breaking results, as well as vital test data and operational experience that laid the groundwork for this latest commercial-scale evolution of the design concept. When it's fully operational, the O2 turbine will have a generating capacity of 2 megawatts, enough to power about 2,000 homes. The structure is made up of a 680 tonne floating hull, measuring 72 metres or 236 feet in length. That's about the same size as a jumbo jet. Inside the hull is all the electrical equipment to power the various systems, and attached to the sides of the hull are two 18 metre long pivoting arms each one supporting a 20-metre rotor with a sweep of 600 square metres. The whole thing is held down to the seabed with a four-point mooring system using some pretty serious chains, each one capable of suspending more than 50 double-decker buses. According to Orbital, about 50% of the power available in the water column comes from the top third, and the currents in Orkney can get up to four metres per second, so those rotors are well placed to capture the full force of that tide to generate power. One of the smart innovations with this system is that the pitch of the blades can be reversed between tides so that they can rotate whichever way the water is flowing. Electricity is transferred from the turbine via a dynamic cable to the seabed and then through a static cable to the local onshore electricity network. And thanks to another piece of very clever design, the rotor support arms can be lifted out of the water in a sort of gull wing motion by a hydraulic actuated linkage system. That makes the whole thing much easier to tow using relatively small and inexpensive tugboats and it also minimises the complication and cost of maintenance and repair. In fact that low cost simplicity was one of the key objectives of the project. According to Scott, as a very rough comparison, if the cost of any given maintenance job onshore is say $1, then that same job could cost more like $100 in an offshore location at the surface and perhaps as much as $10,000 at the bottom of the seabed. So investing in a very sophisticated hydraulic hinge system actually makes good business sense in the long run. It's probably a bit of a stretch to refer to a 680 ton superstructure as a plug and play system, but there really is not much more to the installation than towing the rig to site, connecting up the chains and electrical cable, and pressing the go button. There's none of the huge civil engineering works or CO2 hungry concrete support structure or dams that you get with tidal barrages. Orbital are now moving full steam ahead on the commercialization of the design and they're seeking market support to enable them to build and install multiple units right around the UK coastline and potentially beyond that as well. Just like any other sustainable technology, tidal power on its own can't solve all the problems we face as a result of the climate emergency. But turbines like these could play a very important role in complementing existing wind and solar installations as part of the overall strategy to help the UK to achieve its commitment to reach net zero no later than 2050. 80% of the materials are UK sourced and there'll be an obvious boost to local employment through the long-term operation of the turbines, which means as well as seizing an opportunity to become a world leader in tidal technology, Orbital will also be playing their part in supporting the UK's green recovery. And just last week, the Perpetuous Tidal Energy Centre on the Isle of Wight, which is right at the other end of the United Kingdom, 
announced that they've now gained offshore consents to place tidal turbines in their surrounding waters, and they've signed an agreement with Orbital as part of a target deployment of 15 megawatts of tidal power by 2025. And that's potentially enough to run 14,000 homes. On the global stage, there's an estimated capacity of about 100 gigawatts available for tidal energy harvesting. That's enough to power 80 million homes. If that potential was fully deployed, then Orbital reckon it represents an investment in equipment and services of about $430 billion. Not to mention the raft of jobs around the world that the infrastructure would create. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I should make clear that other flavors of tidal turbine are of course available, but Orbital look like they've solved a great many of the problems that have beset previous attempts at large scale tidal turbines. And this O2 floating rig may just have set a new benchmark for marine power generation. If you've got views on tidal power in general, or if you work in the industry, or maybe even have direct experience working on this project, then I'd love to hear from you in the comment section below. That's it for this week though. A big thank you as always to the people who make these videos possible by supporting my work via Patreon. They allow me to remain completely independent and they enable me to keep all these videos totally ad free, which means you're not bombarded with commercials for all sorts of stuff you don't really need. And I must just give a shout out to the folks who've joined since last time with pledges of $10 or more a month. They are Fred Pratt, Hope Rahuovi, Ernst Divert, Rob Quickers, Andy Bockman, Timothy Kerson, William Toffey, Peter Cope, Matthew Whirl, and Artur Emmanuel Coar. You can join the team at Patreon and get the opportunity to exchange ideas and information with like-minded folks plus watch exclusive monthly news updates from me and have your say on future programs in monthly content polls by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash just have a think. And you can hugely support the channel absolutely for free by subscribing and hitting that like button and notification bell. It's dead easy to do all that. You just need to click down there or on that icon there. As always, thanks very much for watching. Have a great week. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.